Thousands of raspberries. of raspberries, there's over 33 virus and virus-like diseases reported on brambles worldwide and over 15 in North America, but fortunately only a few are common in eastern North America. In this presentation I'll go over the important features about virus diseases and discuss the virus diseases that I've seen in Ontario, really just a few. I'll provide information on how to confirm a suspected virus disease and I'll end with information on how to control or really prevent virus diseases on your farm. So first of all, what is a virus? Well, a virus is a microbe that can cause disease, in this case plant disease. Now some viruses affect human health, but it's important to know that the viruses that affect plants do not infect humans. Viruses are quite different from the fungal pathogens that cause many of the bramble diseases we know. First of all, viruses are much smaller. They can only be seen with an electron microscope, and they're really just protein particles, not even cells. So they require a living host and a cell in order to grow and to multiply. Viruses can move systemically in a plant. So unfortunately, once infected, the whole plant and all the plant parts could carry virus particles. Unlike other plant pathogens, there are no chemical controls for virus diseases. Now because viruses live and multiply inside plant cells, they disrupt plant cell processes. And this can cause many, many different types of symptoms. And the, the type of symptom that's expressed by viruses depends not only on the virus, but it can depend on the time of year, the variety infected, and the number of viruses present in the plant. So these symptoms include things like crumbly fruit or yellowing or spotting of the tissue, leaf curl, and uh, low plant vigor. Virus diseases are often named after the symptoms that they cause. For example, raspberry bushy dwarf virus is one of the viruses we'll be talking about today. One thing about virus diseases, the symptoms show up best in, uh, tend to show up best in cooler weather, especially in the spring and on newer growth. And the symptoms can disappear after a while. But even if the symptoms on an infected plant go away, the plant is still infected with virus and can still spread viruses to other plants. Sometimes infected plants show no symptoms at all. And when this is the case, we say that the virus is latent. And for example, virus symptoms are often latent on wild or alternate hosts for the virus disease. This is one of the most serious symptoms that virus diseases can cause in raspberries and we call this crumbly fruit or crumbly berry. Another symptom is leaf model or, or leaf yellowing and you can see here the irregular pattern of, uh, of yellow and green. It's not too consistent, it's not quite typical of herbicide injury. And this is another symptom of virus, a very unusual pattern of yellowing that's associated with a virus disease. The pattern again is very inconsistent and it's very variable in the leaf. And um, this symptom can come and go and is more commonly seen in the initial stages of infection. Now this symptom of virus disease is known as vein clearing. It looks a lot like herbicide injury, but this is a raspberry plant in my garden. These symptoms show up year after year in the spring, and then they fade away and disappear. I'm pretty sure it's a virus disease because I've never used herbicides in my garden, and also the fruit from these plants is very, very crumbly. Now the last thing I need to define before I get more specific about raspberry virus diseases is what is a vector? Viruses do not multiply outside of the plants that they live in. And unlike fungal diseases, they don't produce spores that are carried in the wind or splashed by rain. And virus need, diseases need help to move around and they need a wound to enter the plants. And the agent that spreads a virus disease is what we call the vector. Some virus diseases are spread by insects, most commonly aphids and leafhoppers or other pests with piercing sucking mouth parts. Some viruses are spread by pollen or seed, and these are very difficult to control. And 
Other viruses can be spread by mechanical transmission that takes place when there's grafting or budding done on the plant. And there are nematodes, particularly the dagger nematode, that can spread viruses from plant to plant. Now raspberry virus diseases are generally classified by the type of vector that spreads them. And so today I'm going to talk about these three raspberry virus diseases, raspberry mosaic and leaf curl, which are spread by aphids, the tomato ring spot virus, which is spread by dagger nematodes, and the raspberry bushy dwarf virus that's spread by pollen. So to start with the, uh, the aphid-borne viruses, there are two aphid-borne viruses which seem to occur in northeastern America. These virus diseases are really important in the Pacific Northwest where they grow a lot of raspberries and where aphid populations tend to be higher. But the raspberry mosaic virus is also found in the Northeast. And, uh, but personally, I've never seen the leaf curl virus. These viruses are vectored by aphids particularly the large raspberry aphid, which is common in the northeast but not abundant, and the small raspberry aphid, which hasn't actually been reported in Ontario. The only hosts for both the aphids and these virus diseases are raspberries, and this fact is very important when it comes to controlling this virus disease, or aphid-borne viruses. Now, raspberry mosaic virus is really a complex of different virus diseases, but it's all, they're all spread by the large raspberry aphid. And so we, we talk about raspberry mosaic or the raspberry mosaic complex. This disease shows up very often in black raspberries, which are the most susceptible. In black raspberries, mosaic can cause tip necrosis or dieback, leaf model, and reduced vigor and yield. In red raspberries, which are less susceptible, you may not see any symptoms unless there are two or more viruses in the plant, two or more different viruses in the same plant. In this case, you'll get symptoms which resemble leaf model or yellows, and definitely a decline in plant vigor and small or crumbly fruit. The disease is also present in wild raspberries and often symptomless. So problems occur when aphids are spread from symptomless hosts, for example, wild raspberries in the nearby woods or bush, and they bring the virus to your healthy, previously healthy planting. So one of the symptoms of mosaic virus in black raspberries is uh, tip necrosis. The growing tip blackens and bends and, and dries up. And another symptom of mosaic virus would be this leaf model. You can see the yellowish spots on a darker background, and this type of symptom is more easy to, to see in the spring. The plant in this picture was not confirmed as having a virus disease, but I wanted to show you it to you as something that could be a virus, especially when you see this uh, leaf puckering. Oh, there's the arrow. This, uh, the, the deep kind of puckering and, and yellow modeling on the new growth. So to control mosaic virus, and these are the virus diseases that are spread by aphids, you really need to prevent the aphids from moving from infected plants to non-infected plants. So first, start new raspberry plantings with disease-free stock. That means grown in a plant propagation program that uses virus-free nuclear stock and tests for viruses throughout the program. And secondly, it's important to isolate new raspberry plantings from wild hosts. You should also separate black raspberries from red raspberry plantings. And this is because red raspberries could have the virus but not have symptoms, and they're more likely to spread the disease to susceptible black raspberry plantings nearby before you even know you have the problem. A minimum separation distance is about 500 feet, but 1,000 feet or more would be better. These distances are not foolproof, but they are greater than the distance an aphid is likely to fly. The problem is that aphids also spread in prevailing winds and air currents, and so if possible, you should think about this when you're laying out a new planting. 
You may be surprised to know that spraying insecticides to control aphids is not really that useful. This is because aphids can spread the virus more quickly than they would be killed by an insecticide. There are a few examples when you might want to control aphids to control viruses, and I'll explain these later. Finally, many uh, raspberry varieties are resistant to the large raspberry aphid. This is particularly true of varieties that are grown in the Pacific Northwest. And this aphid resistance is an important way to control uh, the spread of virus diseases. I tried to find um, some examples of aphid-resistant cultivars. Some of the older cultivars like Newberg and Latham are definitely susceptible to the large raspberry aphid, and so these are very susceptible to mosaic virus. Whereas some other cultivars such as Canby, Reveille, and Algonquin have this AG gene, which comes from a, a parent. Plant breeders know how to transfer or breed for uh, varieties that have this AG gene and are therefore resistant to aphids and the virus. But unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of information about this resistance in some of our modern day cultivars grown in the Northeast. Okay, the next virus I'd like to talk about, and this is the one that I see the most often, is the tomato ring spot virus. It attacks red raspberries and blackberries, but not black raspberries apparently. And the symptoms can range from from uh, none to severe. It's uh, spread by the dagger nematode. So it's really only a problem in soils where dagger nematodes are found. In contrast to the mosaic virus, however, which only occurs in the raspberry genus Rubus, tomato ring spot virus can be found in over 35 different plant families, including strawberries, apples, peaches, tomatoes, and many different broad-leaved weeds. So we're going to have a different approach to controlling this virus in raspberries. I mentioned the symptoms are variable, a little unreliable for diagnosing this virus. It's generally associated with decline, uh, crumbly fruit, a loss in productivity in infected plants. Early in the onset of the disease, you'll see distinct ring spots or foliage patterns on uh, the primocaine growth. And these symptoms are known as shock symptoms and they show up early in the infection or the year after infection and they may not show up again in infected plants. And here's another picture of crumbly fruit. In this case it was caused by uh, the tomato ring spot virus. Like I said, I see this virus most often in Ontario. Um, because the disease is spread by nematodes from plant to plant, it does spread fairly slowly in the field infecting a few more plants every year, generally up and down the row because you're spreading um, nematodes with your tillage equipment and, and farm equipment and uh, they're not moving really quickly through a planting. This is just another symptom of, uh, of some of the leaf, leaf pattern that I saw last summer on a field of Nova with uh, tomato ring spot virus and the crumbly fruit that you've probably seen. Uh, the fruit just breaks, breaks up when you pick it. So to control tomato ring spot virus, uh, first of all you need to, to start with disease-free planting stock. But the virus could already be on your farm in one of its many weedy or alternate hosts. So before, si before planting raspberries, you should sample soil for nematodes and control them if necessary. And uh, if dagger nematodes were present in your soil samples, you would uh, control them by soil fumigation, for example, or, or growing an alternate crop for some years. I see tomato ring spot virus the most in, old, in um, planting sites which were previously in orchard or pasture. I'm not really sure why, but these are likely to have lots of the perennial broadleaved weeds that harbor tomato ring spot virus. So controlling weeds as well as the nematodes can help reduce the incidence and spread of tomato ring spot virus. Now the third virus is the raspberry bushy dwarf virus and the vector for this is uh, pollen from infected plants. So this can be a very difficult virus to control. It only attacks raspberries. The symptoms again vary with the cultivar and the season and plants may or may not show symptoms each year. 
but it is a serious virus because it causes uh, crumbly berry in some cultivars and it's associated with a decline in productivity. These are some of the leaf symptoms we see in the spring with uh, raspberry bushy dwarf virus. For years I, I misdiagnosed this as herbicide damage. It does look quite a lot like herbicide injury. This is another picture of raspberry bushy dwarf on the variety Qualicum. Um, this irregular bleaching is less consistent with herbicide injury. This is a field of primal cane fruiting varieties in the spring. Both are infected with the raspberry bushy dwarf virus, but the variety Autumn Britain on the left shows much more distinct symptoms than the variety Caroline, which is on the right. It's, as I said, it's very difficult to control raspberry bushy dwarf virus, but again, you should also start, always start your plantings with disease-free planting stock. If you do see symptoms of this virus or any of the other virus diseases, you should rogue out those plants if possible. Remove the infected plants and plants on either side. There's very few resistant cultivars to raspberry bushy dwarf virus. The variety Chilcotin apparently is resistant. This is a variety that's grown mostly in the Pacific Northwest. It's not very winter hardy in Ontario. And uh, there are strains of the raspberry bushy dwarf virus apparently which can um, break through the genetic resistance of these raspberries. Now, it's always a little difficult to diagnose virus diseases, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on that topic. First of all, there's a lot of symptoms that can look like viruses. So before you can be sure that you have a virus, or before you even test for viruses, you should consider some of these other possibilities. For example, um, past herbicide applications would be good to know. You should check out the nutritional status of your crop with leaf and soil analysis and scout for other insects and diseases. This symptom is caused by herbicide from glyphosate or Roundup. You've probably seen it in raspberries. The symptoms show up the year after the Roundup was applied or drifted onto the crop. But the chlorosis and the yellowing and the small stunted leaves could be mistaken for virus diseases. Potato leaf hopper can cause a leaf model or yellowing or leaf curl, particularly on the new growth. In this case, a crop scout should find evidence of leaf hoppers on the lower leaf surface. Tarnished plant bugs occasionally damage the druplets when the fruit is sizing and the fruit can be deformed. Or poor pollination, especially in the greenhouse, can result in crumbly or deformed fruit. I've seen crumbly berry associated with too low of a soil pH or inadequate crop, crop nutrition and some varieties are just weak necked and tend to break up a little e more easily than others. But if crumbly fruit predominates on a few plants in your planting and more plants are affected every year, you should have samples tested for virus diseases. So how do you diagnose a virus disease? Well, you need to use the services of a lab that has greenhouse or lab facilities. Uh, there's two characteristic tests that are done to test for viruses. Most diagnostic labs will carry ELISA test kits for the common virus diseases. When you use an ELISA test, you need one test for each known virus. And what happens is the virus from the infected tissue, uh, to put it very simply, and probably not quite accurately, the uh, virus from infected tissue reacts in the presence of antibodies and added enzymes which are, uh, which are put in these little plates in the little ELISA plates on your left. More recently, PCR techniques or polymerase chain reaction techniques are used to identify specific viruses or groups of viruses by their genetic material. These tests are fairly expensive and they're not done at many labs. PCR tests, though, can be used to detect families or groups of viruses if you know the genetic code. But my whole point is really to, to identify and confirm a virus disease, you need a diagnostic lab that is equipped to diagnose the common diseases of brambles. So here's a slide to show some of the labs you could consider, depending which country you're in, um, to send some samples for 
disease diagnosis or confirmation of a virus disease, you should pick a lab and then call first to get the price list to find out what um, what it's going to cost, what viruses these labs can test for. Agdia is a very good lab. I believe it's in Indiana in the USA. It's well equipped to diagnose virus diseases. And the website for Agdia has good information about how viruses are diagnosed. And they have a price list up there too. Other labs you might consider are, if you're in Ontario, the Pest Diagnostic Clinic at the University of Guelph, or in New York, the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. Like I said, it's best to call ahead, find out what virus kits they have on hand. And it, it does get very difficult to ship s plant samples across the border. So if you're in Canada, you need to use a lab in Canada and, and the same in the States. Use an American lab. But whatever lab you use, choose fresh samples of plant tissue with symptoms. And remember that viruses are easiest to detect in the spring because the concentration or titer of the virus in the tissue is highest then. And at other times of the year, you may be more likely to get false negative results and you should test again the next year. Okay, so my last few slides have to do with controlling virus diseases. But really, what you're trying to do is prevent virus diseases from getting onto your farm. And I think I've said this already a couple of times, one of the most important things is to start with clean planting stock. Don't grow your own raspberries, even though it may seem like an economical option at the time. A professional plant propagator will use parent material that has been freed from viruses, usually through a combination of heat treatment and tissue culture from the growing tip of the plant. This is the greenhouse in New Liskard where nuclear stock for Ontario plant growers is produced. You can see several features on this building which are designed to keep virus vectors like aphids away. There's screened vents, double airlocked entrance, and uh, there's no weeds around the edges of this uh, greenhouse. Certified practices for nursery production include growing plants in fumigated or nematode-free soil, isolation from wild hosts, and regular scouting and pest control. So your nursery growers, plant growers, are going to a lot of extra steps to make sure that the risk of virus is, uh, is very low in their fields. The second thing you should do is try to isolate raspberry plantings from virus sources. Now I know this isn't always practical, but it should be in the back of your mind. And isolation slows the movement of aphids from infested plantings to new plantings. And this is really important for controlling mosaic viruses. So separation from wild brambles, older plantings, and separating red raspberries from blackberries is a rule of thumb. The third thing is to routinely, routinely identify and remove infected plants. This is known as roguing. You would scout for symptoms and remove infected plants maybe twice a year. Now this strategy can be effective when less than 5 to 10 percent of the plants are infected. Otherwise, um, if more than that is infected, I guess you should remove the whole planting when it's no longer making money for you. Now the one time you might control aphids is before removing these infected plants from your planting because a spray for aphids to kill the aphids before you pull out the plant will help prevent these aphids from flying onto new uninfected plants. I already talked a bit about weed control and nematode control as a strategy for controlling tomato ring spot virus. Just remember that many broadleaf weeds are sources for this virus and that dagger nematodes have many hosts. And finally, I promised to talk a tiny bit about aphid control. Um, I mentioned it's not feasible to prevent virus infection into new fields generally by controlling aphids. You would have to spray far too frequently. And aphids can quickly transmit the disease to, to uh, a raspberry plant. So spraying routinely for aphids is something a plant propagator does, but it's not really something that's practical on a field scale. However, there are a couple of times when controlling aphids might be useful, and this would be if you have an infested planting and you want to reduce the rate of spread within that planting, and the other is when you're removing plants. 
As you can see, the references and published literature on virus diseases of raspberry small fruit is somewhat dated. These are some of the sources I used uh, when I was compiling this presentation. But our knowledge of virus diseases is changing, especially in the last decade, and new techniques are being developed for diagnosing virus diseases. I'm pretty sure that we all are going to know a lot more about virus diseases in the future and, uh, and in the years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, there is one question from Tom Stevenson about potato leafhopper and whether that's a concern for vectoring bramble virus. It would not be a common vector of bramble viruses that we know. Having said that, there are some other virus-like diseases, which I didn't discuss, known as phytoplasmas that are vectored by leafhoppers. Um, they're not common in the Northeast, and so it's not something I would be extremely concerned about from that perspective. All right, thank you. But oh. <laughs> I do have a caveat there. I do have a caveat in that uh, our knowledge about the types of virus diseases and phytoplasmas is, is changing a lot. A few people are working very hard in this field, and they're always discovering new, new virus diseases. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Marvin has a question about uh, the importance of separating black and red raspberries and new plantings that are established with virus indexed plants. So um, the assumption then is that you don't have virus in your in your plantings, and so do you need to separate them and you know, to tell you the truth, I don't see a lot of separation between red and black raspberries. But I think if there's a chance that your red raspberries are going to get mosaic virus from aphids, from the woods or the bush or a lot of wild brambles nearby, then that the theory would be if you separated those from your blacks, you would uh, reduce the spread to the black raspberries. But the black raspberries are going to be close to those wild sources too. So it's a good point, Marvin. And I think it's one of those motherhood recommendations that you would do if you could. But you might not always do. Okay, I like that. Uh, I, I've never heard that before, but I like <laughs> that <laughs> description of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Pam while she's just finishing with the virus disease? No other questions? Um, so I know some folks don't like to type so much, but I, uh, I'll let you keep throwing up some questions while I change um, our presentations. And she, uh, Pam will be at the um, will be still here for the remainder of this. So if you ha if you do think of something, don't hesitate to just take your time and type it in there, and um, and that would be great. And now I'm going to introduce our second speaker who is Dr. Carrick Cox. Um, Dr. Cox has a program of tree fruit and berry research and extension at Cornell University's New York State Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva. Dr. Cox's program focuses on the chemical management of fungal diseases of apple, stone fruit, and berries with specific emphasis on the biology, ecology, mechanisms, and prevalence prevalence, excuse me, of fungicide resistance in brown rot and apple scab, but he has been instrumental um, helping me certainly and others in the extension field in New York with berry uh, crop diseases. And so I will turn off my speaker now and turn it over to you, Carrick, uh, and Pam, thank you very much. diseases, but I think we'll get to the crux of that. <coughs> Talk, I'm going to go over a couple of items. Uh, Carrick, um, this is Laura. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think we're having a problem with your audio. Uh, hold on one second.
Carrick. Yeah. I'm sorry, this is Laura, and we are having pretty, um, I think, pretty severe, we're, I'm not hearing you at all, hardly, and other folks are saying that the audio is cutting in and out. What if I do high volume? There, you're good now, and, back um, up. oops, do you have your yeah. headset on? Okay, um, now you're, I'm hearing you now, are you, did you put your hands free, the little toggle lock on? Yeah, you can see because it's constantly flickering. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't, and now it is on, and now I do hear you, so hopefully. Um, All right. Why well, don't we It looks move, like there's a slight lag. Yeah, hmm. why don't we move back to the beginning of your presentation. Sure. And uh, I, I'm sorry about that, I couldn't get your attention, you were on a roll, and I couldn't hear you at all. But I'm going to I'm gonna stop out and maybe, uh, now I'm not hearing you again. Yep. All right, there you go. All right, hopefully, I don't know why it's cutting out on us. We have had such good luck so far. All right, let's see how we're doing now. Looks like I'm flickering, so let's go ahead. I didn't say anything too terribly important at this point, but we'll move on to the, uh, the talk proper. All right, I'll, I'll give a little bit of information about understanding diseases of brambles, and then I'll talk about bramble root diseases and management. And then we'll look at root diseases in 2009 and some of the issues that seem to be involved with a small fruit decline this year, and what to do about uh, diseases and root decline in 2010, given our seasonal situations. Of course, this talk is very much geared so to the northeastern United States, and of course, New York where we've had some very interesting weather, but I, I think some of those situations would also apply to obviously, since we share a lot of the same uh, overall weather conditions. So, the first question in this section is, what are the difficulties root diseases present bramble producers in New York? Let's look at this. Sometimes they can be very frustrating in established operations. The reason why is that the most effective management practices are preventative. They occur prior to planting. So if you're getting them in your already established planting, this becomes a very big headache for producers and even us extension people. Oftentimes, they become apparent after the planting established. You've gone on several years, and all of a sudden, they are beginning to show up. <coughs> Three, uh, unfortunately, the post-planting management practices, when you're in these situations, are less effective, and they seem to only really slow the spread. And unfortunately, there is very little one can do to cure the affected plants when the problem becomes um, fairly apparent to both you and um, any extension person coming to visit your site as well. But also very frustrating to identify and diagnose for a lot of the same reasons. Unfortunately, these pathogens are, are soil-borne, protected and hidden in the soil. Just as Pam mentioned with the viruses, these are things we're not going to be able to see very well. And it's not so much the fact that they are small or microscopic, some of them very much so are, is that they are hidden from view. And we don't see them until they've already gone so far that there is a point of no return for action in terms of being a grower. Also, the diagnostic symptoms are below ground, which prevents recognition during a time when you might be able to take action to save the planting. And of course, once the plant is dead, it becomes a fungal decay free for all, preventing you or myself or any other person visiting your farm from determining what actually is the cause. So your key is to catch them early, but oftentimes it's impossible for you to find them early. The, uh, the one good factor in all this is that the most common root diseases affect all berry crops and their management practices are similar. So even if you're not here specifically for raspberries, a lot of the same stuff we'll talk about will apply to all small fruit diseases. Or if you have a diversified planting, as I imagine many of you might, a lot of what we'll talk about here will be very applicable in all situations. Let's look. I'd like to do a little bit of the presentation on winter injury because in many cases winter injury can mimic or look like a root disease problem and be responsible for decline. However, in, in brambles, um, winter injury is a little different than in some of the other small fruits. Um, 
what usually occurs is winter entry usually results from spring freezes in March, and it usually kills the buds only. And it's less so due to winter temperatures overall being just a cold temperature. You really need many days of lower than uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit before you're actually going to start killing primocanes. So for the most part, when you see winter injury, it may not necessarily be a root problem, but it may in fact look like a root decline. Um, one of the things that I've read that may cause trouble is if you do a lot of permanent mulching, it could delay plant hardening and then exacerbate winter injury problems. But that's not necessarily what you can always be concerned about. Of course, in the case of winter injury, any time a plant becomes stressed from disease, including root diseases or other abiotic factors like nutrition, your plant is going to be more predisposed to winter injury. So any time a plant gets stressed prior to going dormant, you've just increased that chance of actually getting damage to winter injury. In this case, that type of damage in the form of primocane damage would be much more uh, uh, troublesome. Consequences, what will end up happening is the plant will look reduced vigor, productivity, the, the floricanes will be the most uh, heavily influenced. They may not, they may break, but they may begin to wilt. And you can get death, but it's very variety specific with very little specific information on the varieties that are most impacted by winter injury. Diagnostic symptoms. In this case, as with other bramble, um, winter injury symptoms and other small fruit, the whole plant may die. But in the case of raspberries and brambles, what ends up happening is the temperatures warm, the floor canes will appear to be wilt while the primocanes remain healthy. Why this is, is that the buds on the primocanes are seem to be the most affected by the winter injury. So when they burst into floricanes, they'll begin to uh, wilt due to damaged vascular connections. So what one can see in these very small pictures, one for my own stuff, and very diagnostic key is that you'll see a lot of the newer floricanes looking rather, rather um, weakened and injured, while the, uh, the primocanes themselves look fairly good. Let's see if I can change the color to something a little more. See that they are dying at the tips and all along that row while the primocanes themselves look quite fine. Let's skip over a new slide. Canes can get killed to the ground, but like I mentioned before, buds are the primary source of affected uh, material when it comes to winter injury. But don't let it completely confuse you. One thing that is interesting about winter injury is that, somewhat diagnostic, the plants will continue or will send up new primocanes that stay healthy. However, if your plants are actually suffering from a root disease, the plants will continue declining throughout the season, as will be more evident when we get right down into the diseases themselves. Let's look at one here, Phytophthora root rot, one of the more prevalent uh, diseases in small fruit and that for uh, brambles as well. It's an aquatic pathogen, which means it basically lives as an underwater organism. It, when it's dried out, it's simply just surviving. That's why it likes wet soils and low-lying areas. These things are all very familiar with. One of the other interesting features of Phytophthora is that it prefers cool temperatures and cool weather, which can be a problem if we have cool springs and cool summers. Let's look at the symptoms. So what will happen is you'll get some um, stunting and chlorosis, can begin to see the chlorosis here. Of course, it didn't draw anything. Hey, come back. Ah, there it goes. Some of the chlorosis just simply meaning a yellow spot. And of course, wilt and death of plants in patches as the soil begins to warm. You can see there's a nice patch of really wilting and dying plants. So in order to diagnose um, a raspberry, let's say you're seeing wilt and death and um, patches in your planting and you want to see whether or not it's Phytophthora or, or something completely different. Take the wilting plant. Don't pick a dead one. Like I said, once they're dead, it becomes a fungal free-for-all and you may not be able to tell what's actually happening. Dig it up, remove the soil from the root system. If you have Phytophthora, you'll notice that many of the fine roots and lateral roots will have rotted away. It won't be a nice, you won't have all the nice bushy fine root material. Cut through the crown and the large roots. Now, what you'll see, if it's completely wide underneath, uh, you're, you're going to be fine, like this piece here. However, if you begin to see a reddish chocolate brown pick, um, portion with a sharply delineated white area, you will begin to note that that is very suspect of Phytophthora. You'll get these chocolate red brown sections, but it'll be sharply delineated with a white 
a slightly white section, like right there at that margin. So that's very indicative of Phytophthora. In that case, you might suspect that your planting had a Phytophthora problem and that those patches of dying plants was indeed due to that. Of course, wet spots and low-lying areas are also going to be dead giveaways as well or suggestions. One thing to consider is that once your plant gets killed by Phytophthora, all the Phytophthora infected propagules are going to hang out in that dead tissue and some of them will get into the soil and remain dormant until you have those temperatures of cool weather and water and will cause infections in later seasons. So if you have a planting that was killed or destroyed by Phytophthora and then you remove the plants, bear in mind that those propagules are still going to be waiting for you the next time you replant and they can last for quite some time, unfortunately. Management. Um, obviously, select a site with a well-trained soil. Use raised beds if possible. This isn't something I always see in raspberry production, but if it was possible, it would be something that would help. And obviously, since it's an aquatic pathogen, as much irrigation, artificial as you can avoid, would be, um, be great. So if you can minimize the water, that is the key to managing Phytophthora root rot, at least culturally. Of course, select an appropriate variety. There are differences in resistance among raspberry varieties. However, they are not often well known and would be best served by looking in your nursery catalog for which varieties claim to have some form of resistance, depending on how large or minute it may be, and picking one like that if you think you have a planting with a lot of low-lying spots and potential wet spots, or a field that's historically more wet. Um, chemical. There are things you can do chemically to manage Phytophthora. However, these are only going to work with good cultural management practices. If you're trying to grow these things hydroponically, it won't matter how much fungicide you spray. Phytophthora, if it's present, will, be, will still overwhelm the system. One of the materials is called methanoxum. It's called Rinomil Gold. It usually involves uh, autumn soil application. However, there is a strong propensity for fungicide resistance development to this. However, there are some newer, softer materials that are actually very effective against Phytophthora. Aliette, Prophyte, Phosphorol, these are phosphorus acid biopesticides. And these you can apply in early spring and late summer to the foliage, and they do do a good job. Um, as an example, they were used for a while to manage uh, sudden oak death in California with aerial applications, and fairly effectively. So these are actually a good alternative to the hard, um, poor, um, fungicide if you have a Phytophthora problem. Now I'd like to change gears and move to the next disease that um, one can find in uh, brambles in our region. Uh, verticillium wilt. It's a vascular disease, meaning that it ruins the vascular tissue and is going to end up causing a wilt. Whenever the vascular tissue is hampered, you can expect that plants will begin the wilt. It's a pathogen on many hosts, including a lot of weeds and vegetables. Fortunately, it's the black raspberries that are usually the most um, heavily impacted by this disease. And according to a lot of literature I've seen, the red and the purple appear as a whole to be less susceptible to the problem. But I would not exclude them from having the possibility of getting the disease. Um, the fortunate thing is this has some distinct above ground symptoms and stuff to look for. This one is easy to identify and not only in brambles but other um, small fruit crops as well. And of course, it, when it disrupts vascular function, it's kind of like not giving the plant enough water. It will be stunted, wilt, and you can kill, or verticillium can kill the plant. Symptoms and diagnosis. What will end up happening first is the young canes will wilt first, from the base to the tips. The petioles will remain attached, and the older leaves will look scorched. You can see some of the older leaves down here at the base of this cane. In particular, they are sort of um, crispy. Um, torn up and messed up. However, some of the younger leaves at the top are, you can still see, are green. So that's one thing to look for. Of course, here's a more severe situation where uh, everything is scorched at the bottom. All the older leaves are pretty much uh, ruined. They almost look burnt. One thing that you can also find in cases of severely infected canes, you'll see bluish spots. You might notice that this spot is a little pale brown or something like that but this area here is a little more blue. These bluish indications may be an indication of verticillium infection. This isn't necessarily the best picture of it. And unfortunately, black raspberries have bluish casts to their cane, which makes it kind of tricky. But look for spots. And there are better pictures, uh, but um, 
not, very few on the internet show this situation very carefully. Yeah, I've got better in strawberry, but this can be something to look for. Management. What can you do about verticillium wilt? Unfortunately, this is a difficult one. The pathogen can survive in soils after weeds and vegetables for many years. It makes a resistant structure called a sclerotia and can hide out in the soil waiting for you to plant after purchasing a tomato, um, a field planted to tomato, eggplant, peppers, whatever. If you plant after many of these um, hosts, there is a possibility that you could get verticillium wilt. Of course, it may not always be practical to wait three years, but it's something to consider if you have a planting declining and it was planted after one of these things. Including things like stone fruit trees, which are um, rather strange, but may be present in a diversified farm in the region. So it's something to watch out for. Um, as Pam mentioned, on many instances, it's very important to use verticillium-free planting stock. If your planting stock has little blue splotches throughout on your black raspberries, it's maybe you not want to use that one or consider that there could be a problem with it um, before planting it. Unfortunately, there's no complete resistance, not like flat-out immunity. As I mentioned earlier, the red and purple raspberries appear to be less susceptible to disease. So if you're coming in after one of these other crops, you may want to consider um, a red or a purple raspberry variety. You can fumigate, but fumigation has become impractical in recent years due to cost and uh, many of the legislation, uh, legislative um, guidelines under which it must occur. It's not something that's done that often, and it's something I believe that we should get away for environment, away from doing for environmental concerns. Let's talk briefly about crown gall. It's one of the other um, diseases that one may find. It's a vascular tumor disease. So basically what's happening in this case is a soil-borne bacterial pathogen is causing tumor-like growths on a root system. Again, it will disrupt the vascular function, causing the plants to appear to wilt. They're going to get stunting, wilting, they're not going to be as productive. And unfortunately, if you get one of these, it will predispose you for a winter injury because the things occur at the crown. And the type of winter injury occurring at the crown is not something that one wishes to have. Fortunately, these are fairly, sometimes fairly easy to find if they actually occur at the crown. Here's two pictures from the uh, Berry Diagnostic Key. In order to find or determine whether you have this problem, look at the base of the canes and crowns. If you, and of course, dig up a root system if you don't see anything. But what will happen is on the lower crowns and stems and roots, one will find these tumor-like growths. Let's see if I can highlight that one. It's kind of a dark color. Um, they eventually will get old and the bacteria will be released as they decay and um, enter into the soil again, which causes problems. So in these instances, there are your little tumor-like growths. And of course, that's the, the cause of the problem. Yes, as I mentioned before, they will disintegrate sometimes after they are formed over the course of heading into dormancy and they release the bacteria into the soil. Another thing to keep in mind is this is a common disease problem in stone fruit and especially grapes in this region. Crown gall in, in grapes is fairly prevalent and if you're planting in land after one of these two situations there's always a possibility that you could be planting in the soils that have this bacteria. Management. Obviously if you see planting stock or with galls or odd growths on the roots or crowns, don't, don't use it by all means. Also, take care after planting after stone fruit and other grapes. If you're finding old root systems with galls and bumps on it, you might want to consider planting somewhere else. Uh, most importantly, avoid practices that injure the crown and roots. So what this bacterium does is it's in the soil and any injury near the crown and roots that occurs in contact with the soil, and if the bacterium was present, can be the site of the gall formation. Hence, in that one picture we showed a while back of the raspberry um, crown, there was probably some sort of injury that caused uh, the bacteria to infect and begin its tumors. Um, as the opposite situation is possible, even winter injury and insects can wound sufficiently to cause um, an infection for the bacterium. So even a little bit of wind injury and insect pressure, if it's too high, can predispose you to this disease if you have soil with a bacterium. Unfortunately, with crown gall, there's not much you can do chemically. So you just have to be very careful in how you um, set up your plantings and the planting stock you use. 
So at this point I'd like to quickly talk a little bit about root diseases 2009 or some of the things that we had run into or possible problems. Questions being is what role did root diseases play in plant decline in the 2009 season? It didn't look like many of you experienced this, thank goodness, but um, there was a lot of it at diversified planting so I thought it pertinent to address. And what can we do to prepare for root diseases and plant decline in 2007? Do they commonly index for crown, um, crown gall and small fruit nurseries? I have no idea. I think it's a fairly rare disease and you don't see it that much. However, I think that any nursery that um, saw the diagnostic symptoms of it, uh, it wouldn't grow it. It's in the soil, much less so in the plants. And so um, the plants would likely be clean unless they were bringing it out of contaminated soil. And I imagine that they would spot and not not even sell it. So I don't know if they specifically do it, but I imagine by just um, common quality practices, they would see it and remove it. 2009, um, I got a lot of reports of small fruit decline, especially in strawberries, but some in brambles and or raspberries as well. Unfortunately, these all happened in the late season and in many cases decline progressed to a point where it was difficult to confirm root disease. However, um, we did find several indications of verticillium wilt and phytophthora and of course winter injury. So that was somewhat surprising. In the last three years of my appointment, um, we've seen very few instances of this. And 2009 was especially uh, a bad year for um, becoming aware of these problems. Obviously the spring was fairly dry and cool, like not, not too unusual. However, the June-July months was really wet a lot of rain, many inches of rainfall, and the temperatures were cool. As I've noted for monitoring weather for other diseases, it was an extremely cold summer, and many of you probably realize this as well. If you have cold conditions and a lot of water, it might have made a very favorable situation for Phytophthora. And it may be that in many cases, uh, mm, uh, yes, uh, according, well, maybe I'll answer that question later, we're almost done. Um, in many instances, uh, if you have cool conditions and wetter, uh, a lot of wetness, you will run into problems with Phytophthora. And this may explain what we've had happen. So what can we do to prepare? Um, the conditions were very favorable for root disease in 2009. There could be a lot of high levels of inoculum. Even if you didn't have any root disease decline last year, the situation may be prepped for having enough inoculum such that if the conditions exist, you could get a root disease problem. If you thought you had decline in 2009 or had a lot of wet spots or maybe some unthrifty plants and it was in a wet spot, some of those situations that would be conducive for Phytophthora, you may want to consider putting on a spring application of a phosphorus acid product as a preventative measure for managing Phytophthora in potentially affected fields. If you get a head start on it, you will be able to uh, potentially manage it. If the disease begins to show up later in the season and you can finally see it without digging it up, it's usually too late to do anything about it. So this year it may be pertinent to use a preventative uh, application of a phos acid product if you have fields in which would or could develop a photophthora problem. Low-lying, wet fields, and or fields with a lot of wet spots. And you went through last 2009 even without a problem. Um, also, there could be increased winter injury in 2010. Even if your raspberries had a lot of foliar diseases towards the end of the season, you know, even things like leaf spots and rust and a little bit of anthracnose, this may have predisposed you for winter injury as you enter dormancy. What you want to do is make sure that your plantings are well insulated and in the spring, scout frequently for the signs of declining plants. Um, you could use this handout to determine whether or not you have a winter injury issue or potentially a root disease problem. If you can recognize the cause of this early, you can take action to get rid of the losses. I mean, many of the diseases you can't do much about, such as verticillium and crown gall, but these are less likely to have simply emerged over the course of two seasons. But this would allow you to get a handle on things such as Phytophthora. Alright, looks like we already have a question. If a primocane is mowed down in the winter and the canes get broken by the mower, will this increase susceptibility to crown gall? I would, I would imagine so. If the bacterium is present in the soil, mowing would be an excellent way to injure your canes 
to provide a source of infection for the crown ball bacterium. However, if you've been mowing for many years and have never seen it, then um, it is likely the crown gall bacterium is not in your soil. Other questions? Carrick, um, I was yep. wondering if you had any opinion about actinovate as a preventative pr approach to verticillium. I've used actinovate in other cropping systems, um, particularly on tree fruit, and haven't had any, uh, <clears throat> haven't had uh, considerable measurable success in getting it to manage diseases that are also fungi. Um, I don't know. I, I'm very hesitant to recommend um, any fungicide use for verticillium wilt because usually the pathogens in the soil and the actinovate is bringing on the foliage. I mean, you could in theory drench it if it is in co coordinates with a label, but I imagine the um, you know, getting it through the soil to the plant, to the site where the verticillium would be, um, is, is kind of a stretch with any fungicide, including uh, actinovate, which is a soft uh, product. Oh, the mode of action, oh, can I, let's see some of these others. Can Phytophthora root rot kill a plant within one season? I would imagine if it got going, you could lose an entire plant. It will look wilted, unthrifty. It may or may not die, depends on how, um, robust your planting is. If it's a long established planting, it may be able to outlast it. However, the Phytophthora is going to be there waiting for it next season. And mode of action. Yeah. No, I was just trying to, yeah, the mode of action of the phosphorus acid pro products. Yes. Mode of action for the phosphorus acid products involves the phosphite ion is actually directly lethal to the Phytophthora pathogen. Now, there's been a lot of work to look at the phosphorus acid, uh, the phosphite ion's effect on other fungi. It doesn't appear to have a strong of effect. The, uh, the Phytophthora is not actually a fungus. It is an aquatic organism in an entirely different kingdom, but it seems to be very susceptible to the phosphite ion. Now, a product like Aliette has to go through several breakdown steps in the soil, while the newer phosphorus acid products can kind of skip the middleman of breakdown and go straight to the ion, and the ion becoming available it seems to be what damages the Phytophthora. Okay, Tom Stevenson has a question about whether or not nurseries commonly index for crown gall. I, I, I imagine that's something that um, they're aware of and would see, but I don't know if they specifically uh, have an indexing program for it. I imagine it would be something that would show up as a catch-all. I mean, it's very obvious. I doubt they would think, oh no, my raspberry has nitrogen fixing root nodules. That's probably fine. I imagine that's something that would flag very easily in a quality control situation. And it's mostly in the soil, not necessarily, you know, it can get in the plants, but I imagine they're growing their plants in very clean soil. So, eh, it's, unless it was a really sloppy operation, I imagine they would catch that. But I don't know of any that have a specific crown, crown gall indexing program. And then Alan Baker has a question about um, fall red raspberries that bloomed and set fruit buds, but in mid-October had a killing freeze. And do you have any idea if that'll have any effect on the season's production? Um, well, if the buds are, I don't know. That's that's a good question. It may have Marvin. No, I guess Marvin's microphone's and probably not on. But um, I don't know. I mean. A, now those, are, uh, Alan, those fruit. must yeah. be like a heritage, a primocane berry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see. What I mean, a killing freeze is is not good, but I think the the quick. Oh, here's here's Marvin. Seems like that Jeff should typing. be. Okay, I would think, but yeah, should be what a they, problem. I would have. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It's hard to say. Shouldn't so be Jeff a problem. Jeff has a question. Um, setbacks or separation of crops if what? it's a mixed vegetable and berry farm? Uh-huh. Yeah, I would keep my, obviously the peppers seem to be the uh, the poster child for verticillium wilt and I, I, I think if, as long as you don't plant them immediately after peppers or um, any of those other veg or tomato, I think you'll probably be be fine in terms of worrying about them. Now, however, Phytophthora can get in all those as well. If you have a Phytophthora problem, in a field and you're planting next to it with your raspberries, um, that could be an issue. What you'd want to do is make sure that water doesn't drain from the infected field to the uh, field of your raspberries. Uh, water will carry the Phytophthora. 
So in that case, that would be the, um, if you can separate them by water source, you can eliminate a lot of the disease problems. Or if you don't plant in the same area where you've had a problem in a vegetable planting. And we usually recommend like a three-year rotational separation using, you know, un unrelated crops or a cover crop or something. Is that? That is, in that is indeed what is on the uh, verticillium recommends for many places. Yes, don't wait three years, even after stone fruit. Okay. So, and certain weed crops, if you have a heavy weed infestation, it can carry verticillium as well, like pigweed and horse nettle, some of those yeah, others. there's a lot of them, isn't there? So there's a couple more people, yeah. people uh, typing in. I spoke of again. how much is too much? Well, well, if you're starting to see flooding or if you can pick up the soil and you're getting a lot of moisture on your hands, and that, that may be too much. However, if your plants are wilting from drought, um, you, you need to irrigate them. Testing farmer. Carrick, did we lose you? No, I'm here. I'm just looking at Jeff's question. Should we test pond waters used for irrigation for Phytophthora? Uh, I, I, I don't know if anyone does that necessarily. I don't know if you'll, you'll see it in there. Um, so much unless you have a problem with phytophthora and other areas in your operation. I don't think it would necessarily be a, a good use of your time necessarily to try to test that way. The, the best use of your time would be to see de declining plants and quickly pull them up and look and see if there's a problem. Or take a healthy plant that's near your irrigation and make sure it doesn't have those nice chocolate um, um, areas with delineated up against white tissue. Use it, uh, extra plant as an indicator. Right. Um, if, as you folks think of a couple more questions for Dr. Cox, and thank you, Carrick, so much. That was a great presentation. Um, and it, but please, there's a little bit more time that if you do think of some questions, let's uh, let's uh, lay them out there. I have a couple of more poll questions that I'd like to introduce just quickly. And um, I'm going to open it up and ask everybody to please vote. There's 34 of us logged on, and if you're a grower, I'd love it if you could uh, to join us. And armed with the handout of this presentation, knowledge of my own operation, and abundant free time, I... Yeah, that's right. Occurs. Um, <laughs> you could just could probably determine the cause of a bramble decline, could definitely determine the cause of, of decline, probably couldn't determine the cause, and still couldn't identify the cause nor what to do about it. We'd love to get some feedback from you. And that handout uh, that Dr. Cox mentioned is available. You can download it onto your um, computer and um, We'll give folks a little bit of time. We, I think we had about 20 growers or 22 growers that were present. I'd love to see that many folks voting. And um, Pam Fisher is still with us, so if anybody has any virus questions, please um, type those in. We can address them now as well. About 17 people, a couple more folks, maybe if they could vote. I guess not, so I'm going to close this poll. And then I have one other, um, hold on, I just got to, we're locked in here. Um, one other pod to a poll, poll to ask you. And hopefully people can see this. I'll try to make it bigger. We'll see if people thought this was helpful to the, man the management. Um, the presentation helpful to your management of bramble viruses on your farm. And if we could get about 17 or 18 people to vote, that would be great. Wonderful. 
Thank you guys very much for participating in this. I want to thank, um, unless, oops, there might be somebody else. Oh, there is another question for Pam. Um, why is puckering of leaves more associated with viruses versus other disease diseases? Pam or possibly even Carrick, maybe you guys could weigh in on that question. They're thinking. <laughs> well, go go ahead, Pam, if you want. I, I mean, it's probably killing some of the faster growing cells. Some cells remain growing while the younger ones are being killed off. It causes a misshapen development on areas in the leaves. I mean, that's what viruses do. They kill cells, so maybe some are. More impact another. Pam, you have an idea? I don't know. We're not hearing her. Fungi rot things, so they don't necessarily cause um, stunted individual cell growth. Oh, something's happening. Yeah, that was me. Sorry, I didn't uh, have my mic on. Yeah, I think if you're trying to compare them to leaf diseases, then there are things that cause puckering, like cold temperature damage or mechanical damage that just makes the leaf grow more quickly in some parts than others. But of the other fungal diseases that attack raspberries, I don't think they work that way. All right, that was a, those are great answers to that question. That was a little trickier. Um, but I want to uh, encourage, if you do have any other questions, now's the time. I'm going to draw your attention one more time to these handouts that you can upload onto your own computer in the file share box. And I think this concludes our um, Bramble Disease Management webinar, but I want to draw your attention to our final um, Bramble and the entire Cornell Berry series, um, Berry webinar series, will be held on Wednesday, February 17th. It's the Bramble Insect Management Webinar. We have Dr. Don Johnson from the University of Arkansas um, talking to us, as well as Dr. Hannah Barak um, from North Carolina State University, and they um, we're very happy to have them, so I really uh, appreciate everybody logging on. I do want to um, just encourage you, if folks, if you do not get the email from me the day before, um, please don't hesitate to either call me or email me, and I'll make sure it gets sent, the connection information gets sent. Something is happening in the last couple of rounds with the bulk email to people. Some people are not getting that, and I... Um, you know, mark it on your calendar, and if you don't see it, don't hesitate to contact me, and I'll send it individually to you. Um, but I appreciate, again, our speaker's time and expertise, and thank you all um, for logging on. Take care. All right. Bye.